Good evening everybody. It's been an office day today so um, it's always a little bit hard to do um, a vlog when you're in the office all day so I've been working hard today. It's been a good day. Got lots and lots done. I'm pretty tired to be honest with you. Sometimes when you're doing things of the mind because you're doing all this creative stuff and you're doing it for like seven eight hours on the trot it's, it knackers you out. It honestly does. So I think it's time for a nice um, taste and refreshing bro. I think I've earned this one. Having a bit of a red stripe. This is a Jamaican one. Now, here's a little test for you. This is way off what I'm going to be talking about, by the way. If you say beer can, right, beer can. Now think about it as ordering your breakfast in Jamaica. I'd like some eggs and beer can. Little joke there to brighten up your evening. Anyway, yeah, dilly dilly, everybody. I quite like red stripe. Anyway, I was um, just having a little look through our YouTube channel and it seems one of our most popular ones and by some of the comments was actually the one where I spoke about um, when we went on the motorbikes and stuff over in Spain and um, shall I tell you a little funny story about that in itself that video was not monetized it's because it's unsuitable for adverts never guess why because the thumbnail had that picture of our model on there showing the knickknacks so there you go that's how ridiculous YouTube is <laughs> sometimes so there you go anyway so that's by the by anyway so I thought perhaps because you like that one and I don't normally really like to talk about myself too much on there I don't really talk about history and stuff but I thought today as you heard by the intro music I'm going to do one that's called thank you for the music and um, this is about what I've achieved and what I've done and how I became a musician I don't do so much now but we'll get to that um, from a very very early age um, my mum and dad knew that I was musical. I'd be tapping on things. I would make rhythms. And, you know, I'm talking about early, early age. And uh, I'd get a tune out of anything or some sort of rhythm out of anything that was given to me. It's ridiculous. I, and I kind of do have early remembrances of that. And then, of course, went to school. And at junior school, it was, I guess we should start a junior school because all the rest was just bits and bobs. Junior school, I took up music properly and I took up the trumpet much to my mother and father's annoyance I'm sure with the noise but actually it was a cornet and um, I had a natural aptitude for it let's say I was born a musician I think think so, some people are just born a musician and um, I joined the school band you know I got uh, pretty proficient at it and of course when you join a school band in the in the 70s I guess it would have been you obviously get ridiculed you're gay and all this sort of stuff you're queer because you play a musical instrument it was quite funny but have a guess what doing that I got to do shit loads in my life so anyone who's got grandchildren want to aspire to be a musician encourage them honestly really encourage them because it opens some good doors it opens some good times so yeah so I got good at school and there's two of us really that were they were this sounds awful I'm going to say this child prodigies that's what we were called because we were really bloody good at it. it was me and a bloke called Nicholas well a kid called Nicholas Betts at that time he was more studious than me. He was more classical than me. I mean, me, I'd pick, pick any bloody tune and try and play it, but he was more into the classical stuff. So he fitted into society, into that type of society, better than I did, to be honest with you. He was posher than me, let's just put it that way. And um, anyway, the school put us in for a scholarship to um, go to either Guildhall School of Music and Drama, um, the Royal School of Music, or Trinity College, all in London. So at that time, I thought, oh, I'll go for it. Well, blooming heck, we got through all the early rounds. Me and both myself and Nicholas Betts got through all the earlier rounds. And then we got to actually have interviews and auditions at the Royal School of Music, at Trinity College and at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. So I do remember going out there with my dad. I mean, my dad was very proud, bless him. Um, he really wanted me to be a classical musician, I guess. And uh, I got into all of them. I could, I basically could choose. So um, I'll be honest with you, Royal School of Music, absolutely not for me. So posh and so stuffy. You could just tell. It's like, 
Well, it'd be like, I think all the teachers would be like headmasters, if you get what I'm saying. Trinity College wasn't too bad. But because Guildhall School of Music and Drama had just been built within the Barbican Centre, which had just been built in London, it kind of fitted what I thought I'd like to do. So bearing in mind, I was 13 at this time. Yeah, 13, I guess. So, yeah, ended up going there, going to college. It was actually, yeah, it was a college, even though I was only 13. So I went to college there in London and uh, it was absolutely brilliant. But it was still establishment. And although I could play everything pretty much that was thrown at me, I didn't like it. I liked the modern music that was going on. And in our lunch breaks, remembering that Guildhall had just been built and it was absolutely top notch with the tech and everything of the day. Um, in the practice studios, there's one particular one which had synthesizers in it. Well, it had a synthesizer. There's a couple that had synthesizers. And they were actually, I believe, they were Yamaha DX7s. If anyone knows about music, they know what they are. Might not have been, actually. It might have been the predecessor to that. It would have been the predecessor to that, because I think that wasn't until the 80s, the, the 7. But anyway, so during our lunch breaks, there was a couple of us that would play pop music. We'd be playing Phil Collins. We'd be playing whatever the music of the day was. And we got told off. And I thought, well, that's a bit weird. Now, in these days, I was a bit of a skinhead. So I wasn't posh. Well, I was a working class lad. And I had, I loved my Dr. Martins. I was at the 18 holers. And in the afternoons, well, let's go from the start. So in the morning, you would go in, I'd have my piano lesson because you had to have a second thing. That's how I learned the piano, although I could kind of play it anyway. And this, my piano teacher must have been about 119. And it had, you go into the, the teaching room, because it's one-on-one, -on -one, obviously. It kind of smelled of lavender and stuff. You get what I'm saying. And the sort of music they was trying to make me play, obviously you'd have your music book, and it was things like a duck swam in a pond. And it was this such childish music to me that I didn't really get on with that. And you'd, you'd normally, what they'd do at the end of a lesson, you'd get stuff to go home and practice, then you have to come back and play it. Well, of course, I'd come back and play Phil Collins. <laughs> So, and she'd moan at me then I'd say yeah but this is a lot harder than what you just gave me and she says yes but you're not reading the music and I thought well I don't need to read music and just hear it and that, that's the way it was so and I had my trumpet lesson which I did actually really enjoy and I did take much more seriously I did really well in that I actually achieved grade 8 honours so I did well in my trumpet piano I don't think I got above grade 3 or 4 I don't know I just hated it well I hate I didn't hate playing piano I hated what I was being told to play on the piano, if, if I guess, if you get what I mean. So then in the afternoons, we would be have brass band, right? So, and um, originally I was put on first trumpet. And um, remember, I was wearing DMs, wooden stage, hollow wooden stage. And I'm, I'm a foot tapper. So here I'm playing classical music and tapping my foot. Well, the conductor absolutely despised me, just didn't like me. Knew I was, oh, well, not knew I was a little shit because I wasn't a little shit, but looked down on me as if I was a little shit because obviously knew I'd come through the scholarship scheme. And um, so I got bunged on third trumpet, which is the furthest away from him. So basically, I was shoved onto the shitty thing because I wore DMs, basically, and was a working class boy. And that's just the truth. Now, Nicholas Betts never came across like that because, like I said, he was a lot posher. And he played first trumpet for it, then soprano trumpet. So he was right next to the conductor licking his bum hole. So anyway, I did a year or so of that. Loved the Barbican Centre. Um, the, I remember there's a French... This is naughty, but I remember there's a French student working in the bar. And he used to serve us. I guess at this time I maybe been 14, but I didn't look like 18 or nothing. So it was quite funny. So anyway, by the by, it got fed up with that and stopped after after a year or two. And um, then I kind of faded away with my music. I think I, well, I discovered motorcycles and I started ragging around, doing a bit of motocross, hurting myself, having a laugh. Obviously discovered girls. And then um, we moved to Flitic. So I kind of lost some of the friends in Luton. So it got disjointed and I, I wasn't taking much notice of music. Then I was obviously into music heavily. Loved the 80s, Duran Duran, Spandau Ballet, Depeche Mode, all that sort of stuff. Absolutely adored all that sort of music. And then it was actually just after I split up with a girlfriend that I thought I felt the interest again to start playing music. But I'd always played my trumpet a bit, don't get me wrong, but not 
you know, I did a couple of things like in the Salvation Army and did, stepped in for people. So I, I still kept me on but let's say not really doing anything. So yeah, so um, as I say, I had these feelings that I'd like to get started again. And I started a job back in Luton as a printer. And uh, no, sorry, as a, yeah, there was one before that, but it doesn't matter. But I moved back and I bought a house. Um, well, I bought a house with another fella. So actually amazing it because it was actually cheaper to do that than the rent. And we did all right out of that in the end, actually, by the way. But yeah, so I started working there and obviously we just got stuck in my job. But then I used to go to the pub every Friday and I actually used to um, hang out with one of my brother's best friends called Danny Gordon. And um, he knew I was into my music and everything. He kind of asked the question, are you still doing any music and that sort of stuff? I said, well, I've been playing around a little bit. I've, I've bought myself a little... Um, little synth of some sort I can't remember so I started fiddling around again and um I said yeah and he said he said your brother said you wanted to be in a wanted to start a band and I said well yeah um I've been playing with a four piece just messing around and this was in the hospital actually it does for a hospital playing a bit of synth but the thing is I ended up that I just ended up teaching everyone else how to play and that's not being being an arrogant shit I swear to god it's not it's just they were shit <laughs> so and that band was never gonna happen we, but we had a bloody good laugh doing it so anyway, so yeah, this this Danny Gordon, um, he said, oh, there's a bloke started at our work um, who's Welsh and he, he's he's really into music, singer and guitarist. And I thought, no, oh, that's OK. So he, he made he set up a meeting for us. So I call him Taffy's Kevin. Kevin White, his name is. Absolutely brilliant fella. So I met him. I think it was in the Clarence in by the town hall in Luton. And we said, how are we going to meet each other? And uh, I don't even know. I think it wasn't like wear a red rose because that would have been a bit dodgy, wouldn't it? Um, but anyway, we just knew who each other was. So we got on like a house on fire. Got absolutely langered. I left Kevin sitting by a railway track, right? Because he he lived in Leegrave, I believe. Yeah, he lived in Leegrave. So he needed to get the train back. Which is fine. So yeah, so we started a band and we called it Keytar, which is keyboards and guitar, believe it or not. And we did brilliant. Honestly, we became the best band around like amateur band playing the pubs and clubs and uh we've voted three years i think in a row as the best band in the area by luton news this is when newspapers actually meant something so it's really good a absolutely brilliant time that's how i met lee again um i've known her as a child but that'll be another story so yeah so from that fateful day i played in a duo of one sort or another for the good part between 15 and 20 years on and off so and we did some good money we progressed um we were offered um residences in greece and spain but unfortunately kevin was hooked up to a girl then and wasn't allowed to do it so that went by the by so i do regret we missed out on that a little bit but i don't blame kevin one little bit it's just the way life is sometimes isn't it so that would have probably moved that on again and we'd have carried on and maybe done something who knows who knows what could have been a eh? <laughs> so anyway as things break up kevin and i at some point split and i can't remember who was next i, I get mixed up with the people that are in the band but i think straight after kevin it was colton colton hunter i went it, we i don't know again how we met and um he was obviously a black fella and he was in all his reggae and stuff and i had best time with him because it taught me different music Again, we did okay. He wasn't the best singer and guitarist in the world, to be honest. And I'm not a bit rude. We did well enough. Okay, there's definitely no progression. It's playing mainly pubs then in London on the London circuit. And then um, again, things come to an end. And then I think it was Steve Duffy, my old mate Steve Duffy, who I knew from school. Now he just sounded like Andy Bell out of Erasure, absolutely 100 percent. You might we did he has been on the show on this thing with us before all his music has with him singing a little respect by erasure and brilliant singer fantastic guy didn't play an instrument mine which is a bit of a shame but um he played the tambourine and the blow-up guitar which is quite funny but we had a we had a who um got on a, like a house on fire and stay still do still know him it's lovely again lovely bloke gentle fella and uh yeah good fun then I think I ended, I don't know which way, I, whether I got this completely right, but I think then I ended up with a bloke called John Pritchard, who now is John DeBarra. Um, he's now moved down to miles and miles away, down Dorset, I think. And again, that was just running the mill thing, doing the clubs and pubs. Great, nice bloke. And then I think I just had enough. 
all together and gave it up. So well, I don't want to be in the band anymore. I want to start writing my own music. I don't want to be playing covers. I want to just do something for myself. And everything kind of stopped. Because that, that was my intention, but everything stopped. Because then I got into the motorbike things. Now you've heard my motorbike stories. So that kind of just killed it. And then when I left Trailward, as again, if you've been watching all these vlogs, you'll know that that didn't end very well. So I turned back to music. Best thing I ever did at that period because I could get stuff out. That's what music does for me. I can get stuff out of my system. It's like therapy. It's like, perhaps it's a little bit like me talking to the camera. Sometimes that to me just feels like therapy. So, yeah. So when we, the kids were growing up, I actually ended up in the little room when, uh, was this before Emma was born? Yeah, before Emma was born and little Luke had the main room and me and Lee in the other bedroom, the three-bed house. And I set up a little studio, I bought a couple of keyboards and stuff and um, just started writing stuff, got my guitars out. I haven't told you about it. I mean, I, I kind of, let's say I just picked up anything and played it, but I got more into guitar, excuse me. And... Um, then I started writing seriously and I thought I would actually want to release an album properly, commercially on iTunes, Amazon and all that. Because obviously this was the age or is still the age of digital music. So um, I said to Lee, I've got to do this. I just have to do it as something to leave behind when I'm gone. So at least my children, my grandchildren will know that I, that's what I did. I wanted to have an album that you could find. OK, not saying the scene that's stuffed in a... A record shop or you know something i did on my own a couple of tips left it in me will nothing like that i wanted it down stamped so i wrote an album called safety pin 10 or 12 songs something like that and if you listen to that this was 2015 okay i actually become not a bad guitarist because i this is kind of punk not the punk the it's punk pop i would say so it's still poppy still a couple of simply type songs in there and that, and that but a little bit more guitar based but ballads or, well not bad, a, sad, a couple of sad songs. So Safety Pin is was about, basically, they're going to push the big red, push the button. And that seems even more true these days, doesn't it? And then there was another one, Ground Zero, um, which was about a homeless person. And that was probably the proudest one, because I actually put that out there and um, said, I don't want any money. For this because I kind of released it as a soft released it I guess as a single to everyone that I knew and all that stuff and said if you're because the song was a homeless one I said instead of paying me money or buying me a beer can you just donate it to Noah which was a children's charity or sorry a homeless charity in Luton and it raised a few grand so I thought bloody hell so that kept me going. So then I actually released the album properly. I had to set up a production company um, or an aggregator, sorry. Oh, yeah, a production company to go to an aggregator and then that aggregator then can put it on iTunes at the time, which is now Apple Music, Spotify and all of the others. And the album is still there. It obviously, it still sells a bit and it doesn't make me any real money. But if you want to go and listen to it, it the band's name that I went under, or the artist's name I went under, was San Sanity Bypass. And the album's called Safety Pin. I'll put a link to Apple Music down the bottom or something. I'll put something in the description because I can't really remember. Um, now, so at the, in, the, in the meantime, I was also, we had also bought the boat. So that's 2012, I think we bought the boat. And I'd actually been writing music more classically type music and soft music for all our vlogs and for anyone who's been following us for a long time will know in the earlier days of us doing it it was all my music i didn't use stock music or you know because you have to buy a license for this music to make you still be able to put it on youtube so which is what i do now i don't really write many of my own now but i don't write anything at the moment to be honest with you so so yeah so that's pretty much up to modern times um again i stopped writing music when we moved on the boat for obvious reasons, I can't have a studio on a boat. I still have a lot of the equipment I stored at my mum's and some stuff in storage. And I have vowed to do a second album, but I don't know how I can do that. I can't do it on the boat. I have got a baby little keyboard on here and I can write a few soundtracks for the for the vlogs and that, I guess, again. But my Gibson Voodoo is up in my mum's loft, all wrapped up in stuff. And um, I've got a nice Yamaha guitar, acoustic, semi-acoustic. Uh, obviously some synths and bits and bobs, drums, 
I've got drum pads and everything. So yeah, so that's one of the things. If anyone asks me, what do I really regret about moving on a boat? I would say it has to be, but there's two things for me. It has to be losing my studio and it has to be moving away from my mum because she was only a 10-minute walk away. So they're the only two things, I think. Obviously space, there's obviously little things, but they're the two biggies, and I do miss having the studio. As I say, I don't know how I could write another. I can't afford to go to practice rooms or hire a rooms, because I could obviously still set all the gear that I've got. Um, I could buy the software again, another two or three hundred pence, but it cost me a few grand. Can't do that. So I don't know where we go from there, but that's about that, really. So, yeah. I actually, I must say, just back to Kita, because I actually forgot to put this. So go back to the first band that I was in. I was the shyest thing you've ever seen to start off with. I never used to sing. I never used to have a microphone in front of me. I just played the synths, played the keyboards. I'd, I'd, I'd do all the backing music for it and all. Everything was us. Well, it was me. Kevin would play the guitar and sing. But I would write, I'd do all the drums and all that, because you, you, basically it was MIDI. But you don't need to know that. These were, you, basically, you, you recorded in a funny sort of way your own background music so the backing tracks so yes yeah, so i just thought i'd remember that so and then you can see suddenly i started getting confidence and when i stopped with kevin i had to sing i had to sing because carlton weren't the best singer in the world so i was thrust more into the spotlight then so and that's how it all came about once i got my confidence with singing that's why what i think that was the key to me writing an album anyway there's my little story i hope you enjoyed that I know it's a bit of an odd one, but as I say, I couldn't feel much today because I was at work. Um, again, thank you all for listening. Thank you all for watching. It, you know, I have quite enjoyed doing the 30-day challenge, I must admit. And although we don't have massive viewing figures, we never will. Um, the people who do watch us, thank you so much for your input. Thank you for your encouragement. Thank you for your comments. I love your comments. I do read them all. Honest to God, I do. I don't get to reply to all. And some of them uh, you can't really reply to without just, you know, being mundane. You get what I'm saying. So yeah, but please continue to follow us, continue to like it, share it, and then maybe we'll get a few more viewers. But that's not the important thing. The important thing is you lot, is me having me therapy in front of a camera, and just having a bit of fun. So yeah, I guess all that's left to say is, I'll see you the same time tomorrow. Bye. My middle finger still raised up to you. Remember my